Hi everybody, welcome to lecture 3.2, Strangers in a New Land. Today, we are going to shift our focus away from Europe and the Middle East and travel to the Americas. Specifically, the focus of our discussion is going to be on the peopling of North and South America. We want to talk about this first before our next lecture, 3.3, where we'll talk about the development of agriculture in the American context. So archaeologists have developed two primary models for how peoples moved out of Africa into Europe and Eurasia and eventually into the Americas. The first is a land bridge theory and the second is a coastal route theory. So according to this first hypothesis, this land bridge theory, about 15,000 years ago, Homo sapiens had expanded into Northern Europe and sea levels were significantly lower than they are today. These sea levels were so low that they actually exposed a land bridge where the Bering Strait now separates Asia and Alaska. The strait that was formed was some, is a submerged landmass known as Beringia. Beringia was a treeless Arctic land covered with a patchwork of vegetation. It was a place of violent climatic extremes and strong winter winds that would have kept animals and human populations pretty low. When humans would have first set foot on the Beringian land bridge remains unclear, but likely occurred sometime after about 14,000 years ago. This theory for the timing of the movement of populations from Siberia into the Americas is supported by the fact that there is no evidence that people were living in extreme northeastern Siberia before 15,000 years ago. Sometime around about 12,700 years ago, temperatures rose rapidly in the far north. This may have been when the first human groups crossed the vanishing land bridge and settled into Alaska. Most early sites from Alaska in the northern hemisphere are scattered thinly over large regions, suggesting that people were moving across the bridge in a kind of leapfrog fashion. So these hunter-gatherer groups would have moved into one territory and then into another. Often these moves would have been separated by long distances and great periods of time. Recent genetic research comparing modern and ancient DNA samples from indigenous peoples in North America have complicated this picture painted by the land bridge theory. In more than a dozen studies, geneticists found that native people in the Americas stem from four major founding maternal haplogroups or human lineages. The A, B, C, and D, and two major paternal haplogroups, C and Q. To find the sources of these haplogroups or human lineages, the teams of researchers looked at human populations in the old world whose genetic diversity included these lineages. What they found was that only the modern inhabitants of Southern Siberia matched this genetic profile found in modern native peoples in the Americas. This finding confirmed the theory that East Asia was the most likely homeland of North America's inhabitants. These findings complicate the sequence of migration events proposed by the land bridge theory. Using mutation rates in human DNA, geneticists calculate that ancestors of Native Americans left East Asia sometime between about 25,000 and 15,000 years ago. Traditionally, archaeologists have hypothesized that these migrants traveled rather quickly across the Beringian landmass in order to reach warmer, more hospitable lands. 
However, genetic evidence suggests that early, the earliest Americans paused somewhere en route to the Americas, evolving in isolation on Beringia for thousands of years before entering North and South America. Archaeologists hypothesized that these early migrants used specialized hide garments and their expert knowledge of nature to, re to traverse the Beringian landmass. Over time, migrants began moving further east and south as, warming, as a warming trend around about 16,000 years ago caused the northern ice sheets to melt. This would have created two passable routes to the south, opening up the migration of those people who created what's called the Clovis culture. Archaeological evidence for the land bridge hypothesis comes from sites in eastern North America and the Great Plains. About 11,200 BC, a highly distinctive hunter-gatherer culture designated Clovis developed. The term Clovis refers to the fact that these early, this early form of material culture was found near Clovis, New Mexico in 1932. This first site contained large quantities of mammoth bone along with several slender finger-long length spear points, what's called Clovis points. To date, there are roughly 10,000 Clovis points discovered and are scattered all across North America in about 1,500 locations. You can see the distribution of Clovis points behind me. Clovis points are very distinctive. They have this kind of lance-shaped tip and are typically about four inches long. They're made from a wide variety of materials, including things like jasper, chert, and obsidian. Extending from the base of the point towards the tip are shallow concave grooves, what's called flutes, that would have helped the points be inserted into a wooden shaft for spears. Clovis points are associated with big game hunters who lived off diminishing numbers of large, now extinct Ice Age animals like mammoths and mastodons. This spear technology could not stop an elephant in its tracks. It could only wound it severely. So they would have had to stalk herds and concentrate on killing stray animals, sometimes even using collaborative techniques to drive these animals into swamps or off ridges. One of these major kills, Clovis kill sites is called Murray Springs, located in the San Pedro River Valley in Southeast Arizona. Murray Springs was first discovered in 1966 but it dates to about 11,200 years ago. The site contained multiple bison, mammoth, and horse skeletons. Scattered across these remains were several thousand stone tools and waste flakes produced from making those stone tools. This hunt, there's also a hunter's camp associated with the Murray Springs site, about 50 meters away from this giant kill area. Excavations of the camp revealed artifactual evidence of hide working and weapon repair. This site yielded the most evidence of Clovis stone tool manufacture in the entire southwestern United States. This idea of Clovis technology as being the earliest indicators that we have for the peopling of North America was uh, was enshrined in American archaeology during the 1890s with the work of William Henry Holmes of the Smithsonian Institution and Thomas Chamberlain of the U.S. Geological Survey. Holmes and Chamberlain argued that humans could not have come into the Americas before the Clovis points made their appearance in the archaeological record because the way through Beringia was blocked by ice. As more and more Clovis points were discovered, this conviction grew among American archaeologists that Clovis tools were the signature of the first human colonization. The whole Clovis first argument rested on the fact 
that the ice corridor had opened just before 12,500 years ago. If archaeologists could find points that dated before that time, then the Clovis orthodoxy would fall. Evidence disputing the Clovis orthodoxy was found at a site called Meadowcroft in southwestern Pennsylvania. Meadowcroft was first excavated between 1973 and 1968 by archaeologist James Adavazio. The original carbon dates from this rock shelter indicated that the site likely dated between 19,000 and 16,000 years ago. That's almost 10,000 years prior to when Clovis points first were dated to. What they found at Meadowcroft were roughly 20,000 artifacts, including lots of stone flakes and tools, fire pits, millions of animal remains. They also found some of the earliest evidence of corn, squash, and ceramics, something that we'll get into more during our lecture 3.3. The site Meadowcroft is particularly significant because it represents both the earliest and longest occupied site in North America. Evidence shows that Meadowcroft was occupied into the 18th century. While Meadowcroft Rock Shelter is certainly at least 12,500 years old, Controversy continues to swirl around that early date of 19,000 BP given to the rock shelter's first layer. Scientists have argued that the oldest layer at Meadowcroft may have been contaminated by older carbonates in the groundwater, leading to a date that looked much older than it actually was. Further evidence for a pre-Clovis occupation in the Americas is found at the Monte Verde site in southern Chile. Monte Verde lies in a small river valley in southern Chile, about 30 miles from the Pacific Ocean. It was a streamside settlement covered by a peat, a peat bog, which helped preserve stones, bones, and wooden artifacts in this area that would usually not preserve artifacts very well at all because of the high moisture content. From 1977 to 1985, Monte Verde was excavated by a team of archaeologists from the University of Kentucky. Radiocarbon dates of the habitation indicate that the site was inhabited approximately 12,400 years ago. What, what archaeologists found were rectangular houses joined by connecting walls, as well as skin-covered huts that were about 13 feet tall. They also found all sorts of evidence for uh, hearths for cooking, uh, mortars for grinding plants, and large quantities of vegetable food. A small distance away from this major inhabitation area was a wishbone-shaped work area with mastodon bones and other stone tool debris. Perhaps most interesting, the excavations in 2008 revealed chewed seaweed remains in one of the hearths at Monteverde. The seaweed dates to between 14,000 and 13,000 years ago, clearly prior to Clovis. This seaweed material appears to have been cooked and then mixed with other plants and was likely chewed for medicinal purposes. The Monte Verde finds offer some credible archeological evidence for the second theory of migration into the Americas. The coastal route hypothesis is based on the idea that the first people to inhabit North America traveled by boat down the Pacific coast. By 13,000 years ago, climate was warming up and glaciers were beginning to melt, making the sea levels rise and coastal travel possible. Along the coastline, sea levels were rising. However, some areas remained open and habitable. 
These areas have been called refugia and could have acted as a way stations for travelers making their way south to South America and North America by boat. Once they reached land south of the ice sheets, some groups then made their way inland and settled in Central and Southern North America. Most archeological material pointing explicitly to a coastal migration route to the Americas would have been washed away as glaciers began to melt, the coastline flooded, and these refugia areas became buried under seawater. So it still remains unclear which of these routes people were taking to get to North and South America. The majority of scholars agree that the land bridge hypothesis is probably the most realistic. Although, as you've seen, there's, there's definitely some evidence to the contrary. As you may have guessed, the peopling of the Americas is a hotly debated topic in archeology. span In your activity for this week, you'll be tasked with joining into this particular debate surrounding the human remains referred to as Kennewick Man. To help give you some context, I'll provide a, a brief background on the case in the remaining time in this lecture. So in July of 1996, two college students stumbled on human remains that had washed up along the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington. Subsequent forensic testing revealed that the bones were more than 9,000 years old. The skeleton known as Kennewick Man was 90% complete and represents a male standing about five foot eight inches tall and weighing roughly 170 pounds. A storm of controversy erupted over the Kennewick Man remains when the Army Corps of Engineers, which managed the land where the bones had been found, claimed authority over Kennewick Man and demanded that all scientific study cease. At the same time, a coalition of Columbia River Basin Indian tribes claimed the skeleton under the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act. These tribes demanded that Kennewick Man's remains be handed over for reburial, and the Army Corps of Engineers agreed with them. Tribes really had and do have a good reason to be sensitive about scientific study of indigenous remains. During the 19th century, anthropologists looted fresh indigenous graves, dug up corpses, and even decapitated dead Indians killed in battle and shipped the heads to Washington, D.C. to be studied. In response to the tribe's repatriation request, eight anthropologists filed a joint lawsuit to halt the Army Corps repatriation process. The scientists argued that the remains had to be studied to determine if they showed an affiliation with modern tribes at all. After years of litigation, the scientists won the lawsuit, and the court ruled in 2002 that the bones were not related to any living tribe, and therefore that NAGPRA didn't apply. As a result of this court ruling, a group of Archaeologists were given 16 days to examine the Kennewick remains. In those 16 days, a team of 22 scientists scrutinized 300 bones and fragments. Analysis of the remains were used to create a 3D image that created a portrait of what Kennewick man would have looked like. These studies revealed that Kennewick man belongs to an ancient population of seafarers who were America's original settlers. And this recreation ended up not looking that much like modern Native Americans. The reconstruction had a narrow skull and a smaller face. And based on these features, the closest living relatives to Kennewick Man seemed to be Maori people in New Zealand, as well as the Ainu in Japan. Suggesting that Kennewick Man was descended of the same group of people who would later spread out over the Pacific. 
These people were genetically swamped by much larger and later waves of travelers from Asia and eventually disappeared as physically distinct peoples, or so the theory went. In 2015, DNA analysis of the Kennewick man remains revealed that his genomes were actually more loose, more related to modern Native Americans than any other modern humans in existence. Officially overturning the previous court ruling that the remains were not culturally affiliated with Native Americans and actually giving the United Tribe Umatilla tribes a right to rebury the Kennewick remains. The Kennewick man battle is important on a lot of different levels. On the one hand, it, it brings up this question of who owns the past and challenges this kind of dichotomy between archaeologists and science and Native American beliefs about not only the burial of their dead, but also their oral histories about the peopling of America. The Kennewick Man case also brings up this slippery question of race. Scientists argued that Kennewick Man was not racially similar to modern Native Americans, and that the DNA didn't fit any category that we currently have. So the Kennewick Man case really brings up how socially constructed race is. Finally, the Kennewick Man case brings up this essential question of who were the first Americans. And it really brings up this problem which archaeologists have yet to definitively resolve regarding how and when and why people first came into the Americas.